Welcome, everyone. Um, unfortunately, uh, fire season is now a season. Uh, this is not good news for all of us, but um, you know, it's what we have, and there's plenty of things to do to help protect ourselves. Um, and we're going to do our best to give you some ideas and talk a little bit about what the risks are. We're not looking to create fear. We just want to be real so we can really take care of ourselves. Welcome. We're just so happy to have you here with us. Yes. And of course, that's Dr. Nafisa Parpia and I am Gordon. Yes. So Sorry. there are a lot of chemicals released when trees, houses, and everything else burns. And so we're here to, to talk to you about, about that how to protect yourselves. And what, and what we have to worry about. Um, you know, there are lots of stuff that happens when you burn things, but what we're most particularly concerned about, I, I say probably number one, is the, what's called the uh, fine particles. These are the ones that are less than 2.5 microns in diameter. You know, the, the bigger ones, the five to 10 microns, often are trapped in our nose and our upper airways. So they can be irritating, but it's the smaller ones that, that um, can get into the lungs and cause inflammation. And the problem with these things is that they're very light and they can drift thousands of miles away from their original source. So, and when bulldozers are creating fire breaks, they wind up disturbing that first few inches of soil, and this can launch these particles into the air. Uh, and unfortunately, they can contain uh, mercury and, uh, and even mold. I mean, that was one of the surprises they found from the fires down south, that they actually how much mold got released into the air, and most of it was from the uh, bulldozing. And I have to say that <clears throat> soon after fire season, I started seeing elevations in people's blood lead and blood mercury. So just, just the acute exposures is what I'm talking about. And the mercury is likely high, higher in people's blood now post fire season, because certain trees draw up the mercury that unfortunately was polluted into the soil. So the trees carry it. Then when those trees get burnt, that mercury gets released into the air and lead from houses that were built before 1978. When they get burned down, that lead gets really released. And sure enough, I'm seeing these two metals elevated for people in the blood and the urine. So this slide talks about the acute impact on the sinuses and the lungs. Now the acute impact would be um, exactly from, from where the, the smoke enters, right? The skin, the eyes, and the lungs, of course. So the first symptoms you're gonna experience would be a runny nose, throat irritation, um, coughing, sneezing, congestion. I'm sure you've all experienced that um, if you've been in fire season. And then of course, into the eyes, you get itchy eyes and, and uh, skin irritation. So the first point, point of entry, of course, these can then become chronic issues. They start here though. Okay, now the coarse particles, I said the five to 10 microns, they can deposit in the upper respiratory tract, but the smaller ones get deeper into your lungs. And the issue we really have is that the inflammation isn't localized to the sinuses and lungs. Uh, once you have an area that's inflamed, uh, it has a system-wide effect. The, the cytokines, the inflammatory chemicals, those all um, are a system-wide, a body-wide effect. And you know, we've seen this in, uh, in, our, in our patients for years, but especially with long COVID, um, when even though there's very little evidence that there's uh, inflammation in the central, I mean, that there's actually virus in the central nervous system, but there is the markers of inflammation are elevated in the central nervous system and in the CSF. So um, we know that inflammation, any part of the body creates systemic issues. Right. Okay. So, um, to talk about the systemic impact of wildfire health smoke. So what's often forgotten by lay people and medical practitioners as well, that we often get focused on the organ that's 
making the most noise at the time. Maybe it's the lungs, right? In wildfire smoke. So we might focus on that. For some people, it might be the gut, but we must remember oh. that inflammation is a body wide process. So if the irritant is affecting a particular organ, that would be the most obvious sign or symptom. Uh, but, but when we measure the inflammatory communication molecule, molecules, the inflammatory cytokines, we see that they're upregulated throughout the whole system. They're not just organ specific. Um, so they're upregulated throughout the bloodstream and affecting all the organs to a greater or lesser degree. Um, so, you know, basically, the thing we're concerned about is obviously the acute exposure, but also the fact that these chemicals and toxins just set the immune system off and increase our susceptibility to other infections, not just upper respiratory things. Um, but the, uh, the inflammation affects obviously the respiratory system, but also the cardiovascular and the neurologic. You know, uh, we saw it in studies coming out of Mexico City, actually, and other places since then, that um, exposure to particulate matters and smog um, it cause, um, you know, premature atherosclerosis, even in young people, and also uh, premature degenerative, um, you know, uh, dementias. Or maybe they don't quite make dementia, but, um, it, you know, they're not um, seen in the person yet, because these are often very young people that unfortunately have died in car accidents and such. But in the brain, there are signs that would that would be considered um, consistent with with dementia in older people. Now, long haul COVID, or they might even be in acute COVID during a fire or during fire season, and then their susceptibilities increase and we see this with our patients, whether they're in COVID or long COVID, or they have chronic tick-borne illness, they're more susceptible during fire season. So there are small particles that can settle deep in the lungs. These are 2.5 in smaller microns. So the smallest particles are less than 0.1 microns, and they can get from the lungs right into the bloodstream. These are the ones that irritate the immune system. There are studies showing an increase of autism near highways because when the tires uh, go at high speed and, and, and the rubber breaks down, that creates toxins that are tiny particles. Um, this is shown in research and in experiments, they've seen that, that these turn on the level of NF-kappa B genes. And these are the genes that increase our self protective mechanisms, and particularly increase TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, and other inflammatory cytokines. Now, these inflammatory cytokines would produce um, transient inflammation, which is the first part of the healing cycle. And, and we need these inflammatory cytokines in the beginning of an insult, whether it's um, these, um, these toxins or perhaps an infection. And um, it's, it's when these just keep uh, going on, when it's not a transient inflammatory cytokine rush anymore. People can be stuck with a rush of inflammatory cytokines. And if you already have long COVID or COVID or the illnesses that we deal with and our, that our patients deal with, and you're susceptible, you're, you're more susceptible to to inflammatory cytokines just not being transient anymore. They're stuck in a loop when you're in a fire. Now, or we have exposure to the yeah. smoke. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so we, we measure the inflammatory cytokines and we see that, you know, that's one of the, the signs that people are, uh, have chronic diseases. Um, and our concern is that um, there was a study published actually from Harvard last year that showed that that the elevated levels of the fine particle pollution that we're talking about, um, that actually probably led to increased symptomatic COVID, okay? And also increased in probably in the people who were severe in them winding up in the hospital because again, it's an additive process. So preparing to minimize your wildfire, 
wildfire smoke exposure can prevent a further exacerbation of prolonged persistence of acute COVID or post-COVID long haul. And also I'm gonna say in our experience, tick-borne disease or mycotoxin illness. So there certainly is an intersection between wildfire smoke and COVID and wildfire smoke and complex chronic illness. Now, the people who are most affected by wildfire smoke are, of course, anybody who's already inflamed, because um, it's not good for any of us. Um, but the ones who are at higher risk, we really should be more careful when during fire season. And so the most vulnerable people are, of course, those with um, chronic illnesses and respiratory or cardiac symptoms, and but even things like diabetes, because we often forget that that also is chronic inflammation. Um, and of course, we have to worry more about uh, pregnant women and fetuses, because again, the immune system is shifting during pregnancy, and you are a little more susceptible to um, the dangers of acute smoke exposure. Now, very young and very elderly uh, also, again, have been to do with modulation of the immune system. Um, and But our biggest concern are the people who work outdoors, uh, and especially the people who like to exercise outdoors. Um, you know, we've seen too many people running around during when there's smoke or when the air is unsafe, you know, and uh, this is something to really be careful about. And we'll talk more in further slides. But um, and now in the last two years, unfortunately, we have the whole issue of COVID, uh, long haul vaccine injury. Um, these are all people who, unfortunately, the wildfire smoke may trigger. So, of course, <clears throat> we want to consider SNPs. There's a slot. I've got a slide here. Maybe you can see it. Maybe you can't. So we'll send these slides out to you guys. And you see one that has a list of some SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorph polymorphisms. These are just small changes in the makeup of your genes. We all have them. And it's about how they express biochemically. Some can make your enzymes work faster. Some can make your enzymes work slower. Um, then, then there's some SNPs that deal with, with glutathione metabolism and the ability for glutathione to act as a, as a detoxifier. That's limited in some people. And there are some genes that increase reactive oxygen species and some that decrease them. And so there's this combination of genes that can cause some of us to become more susceptible to environmental toxins, including those from wildfire smoke. And then for some of us to, to, to be less susceptible, we don't think that everybody has to measure that, their genes. Um, we think it's great information to have if you want it, it, it gives us some insight, but, but we, do, you know, we, we do think about these things as, as a way to understand why some people um, will be susceptible and some won't, why there's a variability in people's responses. So we learned a lot about inflammation, you know, having worked with patients with inflammatory diseases for a long time. Um, you know, we see that exposures to things like mycotoxins, you know, the first, first thing is minimize exposure you know, and unfortunately we can't leave for fire season, at least most of us can't, you know, but what we need to do is prepare our homes and our bodies. And I think the first thing is just preparing your home, okay? And this is one time when a really tight house is useful. You know, I think a lot of people have developed some environmental problem, illness problems, because we made houses way too tight for many years trying to keep warm. Um, and we have problems of indoor air pollution because of that. Uh, you know, a tight house and a gas stove and cooking, probably not a great thing. But during fire season, a tight house is a good idea. You need that protection. So make sure the windows and doors are sealed, the vents are closed, and use your air conditioning, you know, um, or heating. We'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. But, um, and minimize what you do in the house. Okay, so again, 
don't burn candles. <laughs> don't, don't use gas stoves if you can avoid it. Um, and, you know, watch out for uh, even simple things like vacuuming. Um, probably not a good idea. If you need to vacuum something, a small handheld HEPA vacuum might be the best. Um, but swifters during fire season are your best bet. Okay, because anything that disturbs the airflow in your home may um, move toxins or particulate matters that have settled down or on the floor. So using a Swifter is the best way to clean that up. So you really want to have a good HEPA filter on your central air or central heat so you can be filtering your indoor air. Um, these are recirculating units, so they're not bringing outside air in when you're using them. Um, you want to try a HEPA filter that's equivalent to a MERV 17. This will help maximize your indoor air quality. A good idea is to consult with your, with your HVAC providers. And um, we also like to have um, small room filters as well. They're very, very helpful. We like Air Doctor and IQ Air, and there are others as well. Also, you want to make sure that your antioxidant system is well balanced. Before we talk about any supplements, there's just so much that you can do that doesn't cost anything. So you want to pay attention to your local air quality ratings. This way, you're going to know your risks. Um, I like the Air Care app. You want to limit your outdoor activities and minimize outdoor exertion. I've seen just way too many people running um, in the smoke. And I, and, and I want to tell them that don't do that. <laughs> you know, so don't, don't run in the smoke. It's just too much, too much impact on the lungs. And wear an N95 mask if you have to go outside. Or if you're highly susceptible, maybe you have long COVID. Maybe you are chronically inflamed because you've got um, chronic tick-borne illness, for example, um, and you need to go outside, you want to consider a half mask respiratory, uh, uh, sorry, uh, respirator with a P100 cartridge. This is a big deal. It's a, it's a big thing. Um, <clears throat> if you're susceptible, you want to use that. So the N95 um, will protect you from about 95% <clears throat> of the particles, and the P100 cartridge protects you from 99.8% of the particles, and it also fil filters out oil-based particles. So you wanna keep your indoor air as clean as possible, as we discussed earlier. You wanna make sure that you're drinking only filtered water. Yeah. So supplementation, you know, I, we all, take supplements, so I shouldn't say we all, but most of us take supplements uh, a lot of the times. Uh, and, you know, probably uh, in the past when food was food and we exercised in our regular life and stress was not as uh, consistent, uh, maybe we didn't need as many supplements. But uh, these days, um, I, think, I think supplementation is probably needed and especially, um, in the wildfire season, uh, it just it increases the, the emotional stress and the physical stress of inhaling the smoke. Also, uh, is a great producer of free radicals. You know, so not one supplement is going to work for everyone. But you know, once you've got your basics, that healthy organic diet, okay, maximizing fresh foods, um, minimizing the packaged foods. And remember, no matter how healthy and wonderful packaged foods sound, they're not the same thing as fresh food, okay? And uh, in the better part of the year, when there's no smoke, increasing the physical activity as much as your body can deal with, you know? Um, there's nothing like that to uh, just have the, your body's ability to create and also get rid of the reactive oxygen species, which is part of being healthy, okay? But unfortunately, a lot of uh, the patients that we see just can't be physically active um, enough to really push their systems. So we have to supplement. Um, and, you know, so the most, some of the basics that I think that everyone should be making sure they're getting is basic B vitamins, but especially vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin D, 
and things like N-acetylcysteine, uh, it's inexpensive. Um, you know, many people do well with um, using glutathione supplementation, but that can get expensive. Uh, and N-acetylcysteine is helpful right there. And broccoli extracts uh, with the sulfurophanes will help your uh, body be able to detox some of the other chemicals a little bit better. And last but not least is your mental and emotional well-being. So do allow yourself to process your emotions. It can be a very emotionally difficult time, especially if you've lost your home. And even if you haven't lost your home, your loved ones have lost your home where you're walking around in this twilight and um, it's intense. So do seek spiritual solace if, um, you know, whatever that means to you. Some people pray, some people meditate, some people sing, some people just go, they, they go ground in the earth. So whatever it is um, that, that helps uplift you, be sure to do that um, as much as you can and, and make sure that you're connecting with friends, family, community as much as you can as well. Um, we can't stress how important the emotional and, uh, and mental well-being um, for everybody is during such a stressful time, this global pandemic that we're all, or global trauma we're all going through with this pandemic and now on top of it, fire seasons. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, and I, I'm hoping that we can do some question and answers because I was um, there's some other things that people can do for personal protection that I think I'd like to get into. But uh, well, someone asked a good question: Would someone with that with the glutathione S transferase M1 deletion need to protect their health? Um, well, again, the uh, probably NAC will help because. Um, and also the, the broccoli extracts. Remember, the good thing about the body is that it's redundant, okay? Oops, hello. Um, <laughs> everything. It, it's, it, it has, you know, the glutathione S transferase M1 is, very, is a very common SNP, okay? Um, and, you know, you're not doomed if you have it. It's just supporting the other aspects of, the, and of glutathione by making sure you have more and um, making sure that you have um, you know, adequate vitamin C and vitamin E. Um, you will be able to get around that. You also want to have the cofactors that help with your methylation system on board. So um, amino acids, minerals, um, selenium, magnesium, for example. I want to also have molybdenum, molybdenum on board. All of these are, are, are cofactors, B vitamins for, for uh, your detoxification system to actually work. So if you have some, some deletions in your glutathione SNPs, maybe you have one, maybe you have a couple, your body has a, a, a more difficult time detoxing. So all of a sudden you're in fire season, you, your toxin load has increased, you add glutathione, it could be difficult for you. So you want to make sure that you shore up on all of these um, these cofactors. I like to test the cofactors on my patients. Um, or so, sometimes you don't need to. If that test is expensive, you can just take some take some vitamins and some minerals. Right. Yeah, I, I think what Dr. Parvi was, uh, was was saying that was so important is. It's just this, this idea that supporting the whole system, because very few of us have SNPs that leave us um, uh, just in mortal risk. Okay, there are SNPs that can do that, but those are Ill, you know illnesses that usually um, will have will get you really ill or kill you before you're ten. Those of us who make it past ten fairly healthy. Um, you know, we have, re we have pathways that get around any of these SNPs. Okay. So that's the important thing to remember. They are not, um, you know, they're, they're not your future. I mean, it's not like you have no, you, you, you're, you're, you're going to always be sick because you have a SNP. Okay? A lot of patients come in, they say, I'm doomed. I yeah. have the SNP. Yeah. It's not true because, because you do have other, other genes that can, that can get around uh, where, where you have the stems, but, but we do think that the genes are important. And like I said, if you do have issues with methylation or with, with glutathione SNPs, you want to find ways to support that, which is 
using the cofactor support. Chat, okay, chat has been disabled for attendees. Okay, so that somehow the consumer account holders. Oh, okay. Someone was very helpful. <laughs> yeah, there's no chat. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. It's been a technical disaster. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're like we're driving without brakes. Okay. But it looks like people can go in. Panels. Okay. No, there's a way to turn it back on. Chat has been disabled. Can you can you all hear me? Okay. So all we have is the q and A, I guess, um, but we now know how to turn it back on. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay. Are there any other answers? Can um, I don't think there are any other questions. questions. I guess we can end and maybe we will um, redo this in a very shortened form to just hit some of the high spots with it, with the slides working um, and the ability to chat because I really wanted to hear people's questions because there's so much to talk about here. Apparently someone sent one, but I don't see another question. Okay. Um, so check chat. There isn't any chat anymore that's what the gentleman was some nice person was telling us oh. oh wait a minute here let me just see let's see what this is ah uh, here we go can you oh can you go into more detail about how inflammation can spread throughout the whole body oh um that yes um if you're still out here with us um it's basically how our system works okay is that when you when you create inflammation uh, local inflammation is never just a local event it is mediated by your immune system so um the first um neutrophils let's say that are in the or white blood cells that are in the area where something is either irritated um they quickly start releasing chemicals you know called cytokines uh and chemokines especially chemokines that will right <laughs> <laughs> we might have extra noise as well as no slides. Um, these 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 signals call other white blood cells, especially um, you know your macrophages, um, and then in time your T cells and B cells. So it's a system wide event. Now, I mean, just think of it. Now, usually the body's pretty good if it's a very mild you know infection or irritation um the body's able to contain that noise so even though you're releasing some of these chemicals they're very low amounts things like the I, people talk a lot about IL6 IL8 IL4 these will actually make you these are some of the ones that help trigger the 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 the, the systemic signs of illness such as fever and fatigue and malaise, um, but they have to get quite high to do that. So mild, not a big problem, but if the inflammation um, is significant in the lung, um, it's signaled throughout the body and these um, inflammatory chemicals are floating there um, and and um, ricocheting off each other. That you know, basically, that's what vaccine reactions and post and long COVID um, probably is predominantly. In long COVID, there could be some inter in, in element of clotting, but there's a lot of just persistent immune activation. Um, now, when the body's working the way we want it. As soon as you start to get inflammation going, you also start shutting it down. And it's those breaks that often aren't working when we develop chronic illness. Uh, you know, sometimes it's because the chronic trigger is still persistent. And that would be like if you were living in an ongoing polluted environment, you have a low level of persistent inflammation. So I hope that made some sense. So um, we've got one person enjoying our webinars. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Despite the technical difficulties, I'm, I'm happy that you that you're enjoying this. <laughs> um, so are you still doing glutathione nebulizers for smoke? Susan is asking. Yes, we are. Um, 
we, we do find that nebulized glutathione is very, very helpful. Um, so yes, yeah. but that's for our patients that right. we, I, have, I, we have people. I was Go just going to say there was a, 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 somebody else was asking a question that applied to that. They're asking how, um, you know, um, you know what can what? How do we get the things that are stuck in our lungs out? Well, the good part is that um, the lung is very good at cleaning itself, uh, at getting out. Now, again, some of the um, very tiny particles. Um, it, it, they can lodge there for sometimes forever, but uh, most of the time our lungs are able to uh, slowly move them out. They can be absorbed into the body uh, sometimes because you have mac macrophages and lots of other, which, you know, eaters, these little cells that can take up foreign, foreign things and get them into the circulation and then into the lymph and then get them out of us. So we um, do use nebula. I want to go back to yeah, the question. So yeah. we do use nebulized glutathione. It, what Eric was talking about was very important. And the nebulized glutathione helps to prevent that. And so we'll see people who have inflammation in their lungs and um, we have them do a trial. These are our patients, have them do a trial of nebulized glutathione in the office first before we have them do it at home. So you don't want to just get in and nebulize it and, and do it at home without instruction from your doctor because you want and, to make sure you're doing it the right way. And more importantly, very rarely, there are some people who will get a flare of, of asthma um, with, with glutathione. It's a rare thing, but it can happen. It depends how your body metabolizes um, some of the prostaglandins that can be turned on. Now, the other part of the question that this person had was the levels of dampness or dryness um, uh, affecting uh, the lung mucosa and also um, the effects of how the smoke and fire retardant chemicals from the fire stick in the lungs. And um, as, as I said, getting stuck in the lungs, we, we, we depend on the lungs surfactant and um, uh, they have a lot of the lungs, a lot of the lungs immune system is just that, is being able to um, basically eat or move up and, and, um, into the mucus line, in, into the mucus and expel it. I mean, that's, that's what our system's pretty good at doing. Now, um, you know, extremes, extremes of, of dryness and uh, moisture can have can affect the lungs, you know, very, very dry lung, very, very dry air, of course, makes things harder. Uh, the very, very, very moist air um, generally isn't too much of a problem for the lungs. They can, they can deal with that. Um, it's but, the extreme but dryness. With, with the extreme moist air also comes mold issues. And after fire season, we've seen a lot of mold issues come up as well. And, um, and, and people are, are more susceptible as well because of the inflammation um, due to the fires. So, you know, I would say that N-acetylcysteine helps a lot in, in loosening up the, um, the mucus, the glutathione will help with bringing the inflammation down. And yes, you mentioned the breathing exercises, those are really gonna help as well. Now, some people though, they can't even do breathing exercises because it's so intense. This is when the nebulization of glutathione um, is very, very helpful. And then um, if these persist after fire season is over, then I'm definitely assessing my patients for mold and mycotoxin illness because it is connected to fire season, unfortunately. Yeah. And people are asking about nebulizing NAC uh, and that can be nebulized as well. Um, again, it's the same concern. There's something about the um, sulfur, con the, the sulfur, um, because a a both NA you know, NAC is cysteine, which is a sulfur containing amino acid that can trigger um, asthma in some people. Uh, it's very uncommon. I mean, I looked into this uh, what was it, 20, when we, the first anthrax scare we had when it was like 2000 or something. Um, and uh, uh, I, I was part of a group writing a paper about natural natural treatments for anthrax <laughs> exposure. Anyway, and, and we, we, we found this out and, so, and we've been careful with, with these inhaled um, sulfur compounds just because of this possibility. But again, 
so don't do it at home the first time. Um, other people are asking about other nebula things to nebulize safely. They're talking about that doctors have recommended nebulizing hydrogen peroxide. There's um, a lot of controversy around that. But yeah, so <laughs> what I'm saying is that um, if you're interested in that, uh, doc, uh, I believe um, Dr. Um, Schallenberger's website has a write up about it. Um, I think the most important thing to remember is you really should be talking to a physician before you do these things, just because um, unless you're a chemist, you can easily make a mistake in the concentration of what you're doing, and the poison is in the dose. And that's just so important for people to remember, is that you can really hurt yourself with using very safe things at the wrong dose. Exactly. And, 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 and hydrogen peroxide is not a very, very safe thing in the wrong, in, in your lungs, anything but a very, very, very dilute dose. So um, I said, you can read about it, but please, you know, be careful. I mean, it, it, it's, we're in this crazy world right now where, um, you know, many good ideas die because people do them inappropriately. And then the media and the mainstream medical establishment, which doesn't look at these things, then just uses a bad example to trash the whole thing. The whole system. So, um, so please use your. Be careful. Don't just try anything. Okay. Uh, yeah. So someone asked about um, premature um, people. You know, I do believe. You know, they're asking a question. I don't know for sure, but um, you know, when babies are born prematurely, they do have inadequate surfactant in the lungs. But I, that usually uh, it repairs. But I'm not sure if it repairs completely. So I would have to have you talk to a pediatrician about that. And it's yeah. a brand of N acetylcysteine. Um, I, I, I like to use pure encapsulations or integrative therapeutics. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and, but, but basically, uh, again, if you use any, uh, with my advice about supplements is that if it's an expensive supplement, then you want to make sure that you're buying it from a reputable uh, manufacturer and a reputable place. Um, cheap supplements, you can be pretty sure you're probably going to get what's on the label. Expensive supplements you buy on Amazon, you may not be getting it because it, it's just there's money to be made. Um, but uh, so just, you know, a little buyer beware there for the real expensive stuff. Now, the air purifiers compare, and uh, this is this is a question I wanted to do a deep dive on, but the deeper I went, the less I, I yeah, I, even the, the people that we work with who are specialists in um, environmental medicine, and I'm talking about the people who come and inspect houses and, you know, this is their life. They don't agree on what the best air purifiers are. <clears throat> you know, we mentioned two brands because we were fairly comfortable. These guys, um, you know, be, because of the experts in the field, they they feel that these two do a good job. But the thing about air purifiers for the home, they only work in one room pretty much. Even if they say they're good for fifteen hundred square feet, if there's a wall between you and the air purifier, it's not doing much in the other room. Okay, because uh, it really takes air circulation. And the other thing to be aware of, it would be, it's good if you can to move it around a little bit because you set up air currents in the house. And if you keep everything running the same way, you can wind up clearing only part of the air. Um, they've seen this with, in rooms where they've filled with smoke and you have an air purifier and you can have like a few feet that are clear of smoke, but there's still smoke above and below. So it's good to have a little bit of airflow in the room. You don't want to put in a very large fan because again, that's going to stir up particulate matter that might have at least settled during this fire season. And I'll shut up. But one last thing is one of the uh, experts that I talked to did recommend, um, I believe it's, I don't remember which, if it's called the Atom or A-T-E-M. It's a very small uh, air purifier. It's about the size of a dinner plate. And you can use that for people who are very sensitive, just near your face, if you're sitting at a desk for long periods of time or when you're sleeping, because it's a very good HEPA filter and at least it will reduce your direct exposure. You know, And especially if you have your house fairly clean, this could take it to a next level for you.
And somebody asked about breathing exercises. So there is an Ayurvedic breathing exercise that can help the lungs and also the thyroid. So you want to take a deep inhale for five. Look up for three. Come back to center for three. And then exhale for five. And that is said to help with the thyroid and the lungs. And um, oh, someone's asking about sinus issues. I'm going to talk about oh, this. Oh, please, yes. So, <laughs> okay, so so the sinuses are located very close to the brain, and there's a nerve. It's called the olfactory nerve, and it hooks right beneath, right behind the sinuses, literally into the brain. Now. We know that mycotoxins can cross the blood-brain barrier and inflammatory cytokines can cross the blood-brain barrier. And I'm not sure if some of these particles can, maybe they, maybe they can, maybe they can't, but I know that the inflammation that they cause can cross the blood-brain barrier via the olfactory nerve. And so a lot of our patients have sinus infections. And now after fire season, they're more susceptible to these infections because it's more inflamed up in there and it's more dry in there. And the more dry it is, the more infections, the more infection prone we are in our sinuses. And so we wanna make sure that we do treat the sinuses. This is complex. It's definitely not a one size fit all, fits all treatment. Um, we do test our patients to see what infections are in there. It could be bacteria, funguses, um, biofilm, of course, Marcons, which is common in our patients, and um, inevitably, there there are those infections. There, I'm seeing layers of infections in people's sinuses lately. I'm so glad you're bringing this up because it has a major impact on the health of the brain. And um, it's it, it, how to treat it. I can't give you a protocol right here, right now, because I don't know you and I don't know what your issues are in your sinuses. I don't know what bugs you have in there, um, but but definitely I work to bring inflammation down in the sinuses first. Could be with nebulized glutathione. Okay, then I'm working to kill the infections. Maybe I'm nebulizing an antibiotic or some herbs, and then I'm using um, neuroimmune peptides to bring inflammation down afterwards. Uh, maybe I'm using RG3 to help with the mitochondria of the brain, that's not a peptide, but it certainly helps with that. Or um, maybe using C-Lank or, or C-Max. Those are peptides that, that are um, neuroimmune stabil stabilizers. But again, what I found is if you're using those peptides first, it, it doesn't help so much. You want to bring down the inflammation and kill those infections in the sinuses first, and then bring on the, the neuropeptides. So um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a big topic. And, and just to reinforce that, this is the problem of this new season we have, this fire season is that, um, you know, in people who have a tendency to sinusitis or just sinus congestion, I mean, yeah, just chronically, they feel, you've, if you feel pressure in your face regularly and you can't breathe through your nose intermittently, you've got an issue there. Um, and many of us just live with it. But um, as, as Dr. Parpi was saying, is that it can affect your cognitive function too. We're, we're, we've been, I've been surprised ever since I've watched Dr. Parpi really treat aggressively um, the sinuses, how people with brain fog have improved without us doing a whole lot else because the olfactory nerve connects to the hypothalamus that's the master regulator of your hormones right so it's going to affect your hormones when you have sinus issues it's going to affect um even adrenal output and so it you you, you could become moody you could um have brain fog because of the sinuses and so that's what I have to say about the sinuses. It's really, yeah. really important. So once we treat the sinuses, it's very often that brain fog is going to lift or it's easier to then treat the hormones. They start to balance even more as well. So somebody's asking, what type of test do you use? Um, the 
I always call it the Marcons, but I think it's Myco. It's it's by uh, Microbiology DX. Yes. And it's a swab, and and. Uh, so you can ask your doctor to order that. That's that's not a, that's an easy test to do and not very expensive. And someone asked about the P100 mask. No, it doesn't deliver fresh oxygen. Um, it, yeah, I mean, you can actually, because the, the P100s are half masks. They kind of look, I mean, this is not something that most of us would need or use. You, um, But it's very useful if you happen to have a really sensitive system. And God forbid we are in another one of those years like we had in 2017 and 19, I'm, I lose track, but you know, we have heavy smoke and you're very sensitive and have to go outside and do things. It's probably worthwhile. I mean, for most of us who um, don't have severe lung issues um, or severe inflammatory issues, you know, the N95 and, you know, just to walk out and do things is probably fine, but, but short, minimize it. One important thing is don't go out and and do chores outside um, until that air quality gets into the good range. Um, and even the good range is probably not so good. <laughs> okay, that's one thing. Um, you know, when I think they have it at 50, below 50 is considered good, but really, I mean, really good is probably below 10 or 20, but, um, but in this day and age, it's sort of like many of our markers, we've normalized them for our abnormal world. Um, Someone is asking, any idea what parts of California, Oregon, Washington do not have these wildfire smoke exposure issues? This issue seems to be becoming more and more common, which is why I ask. I would say that, well, these particles can travel for thousands of miles, okay, in the air. Then they go into the water. The water goes far. So even when, when there was Fukushima, those toxins were were um Eric, do you remember how far they went? Like oh, they came far? they came, came here, here, but 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 luckily, right? yeah, but, luckily a lot of them dropped out over the ocean. Yeah, but but, but we but have toxins them. can spread, toxins yeah. spread far. So I don't think that yeah. it's limited to only certain areas of Washington or California. I think it's widespread and it our just, patients come from all over the country. And just and, and, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I think it just depends where that fire is. And since fire can be anywhere, and we had a lot of you know, the fires in Washington affected us, you know, um, obviously not as much as the fires, in, you know, the campfire yeah. or but or, so what I was saying is that our patients come from all over the country and and I'm seeing higher metals in people lately from all over, or I'm seeing higher. Uh, higher solvents in people from all over. Is it only because of the fires? I don't know, but I think that it, I think that yes, I think there's a, a correlation. Yeah, you know, I think that the, the research that's being done has been really helpful to show this. Yeah. So unfortunately, I think we're, we are, you know, just like, uh, you know, global warming, it's a global problem. Yes. Okay. So I think. Uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. it. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just looking over here because that's where your questions are. <laughs> and I'm a little blind, so I have to like look close. Okay. Well, okay. thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Actually, one, one second. Someone says, I understand. I just intuited that the direction winds tend to blow, that being at higher parts may be more, more safe. safe. Uh, God only knows. I don't know. <laughs> Smoke yeah. blows everywhere. Yeah. Yes. And somebody asked about the metals coming from vaccines. Well, there um, are some there are some vaccines that have metals, and then there are some that are that don't. Um, and as far as I know, the 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 COVID the the mr the mrna vaccines um, don't have any at least any significant levels that people have measured, especially of mercury, because that was used to be our big thing. Um, when you were giving kids, you know, like their 20 or 30 shots, which are now more, and they had metals and they had mercury, it was significant. Now they've, they've cut a lot of it out, but not all of it. And yes, some of the flu shots, if people are getting them. But again, I don't think that's the what we're seeing. The increases are across the board. And um and the fires are probably the most efficient way to spread toxins. I mean, that 
that's what's been um, so surprising and, and so upsetting to me is, is uh, you know, we, we do our best to try to live healthy and yet we've created a world that's the making it a little harder. Patients often say, I eat organic. Why is this happening to me? I eat so healthy. What, what's going on? You know, when they look at their labs, they're so disappointed to see the high metals and, or to see the high chemicals. And yeah, it's not their fault. It's just by virtue of being on the planet right now. And we were talking about the genes earlier. Many people, when you look at them, have SNPs in their genes of detoxification. So when we look at someone's SNPs side by side with their toxins, there's a lot of correlation that we see. Then you look at that, their symptoms, and it all correlates. Yeah. And, so, and just to, I mean, one of the things I, I see a lot of people who are really fairly strict organic diets, and yet occasionally their glyphosates are the highest we see. So there's something more happening. Um, probably it's water and food storage that's causing the problems, but it's an exp exploration. Um, and uh, it's something that luckily a lot of people are now beginning to pay attention to, and hopefully we'll get some really good research out there and help us all help ourselves and each other. Yeah. So, so I just say to, to wrap it up, that the big take, the big takeaways are that this can affect the sinuses. People have increased environmental toxicants, mercury, lead, pesticides, insecticides, solvents, um, and um, increased brain fog, right? Due to the sinus issues. So these are these are the chronic the chronic issues we're seeing we're seeing COVID long haul being exacerbated or we're seeing complex chronic illness being exacerbated. So this is what we're seeing happen. But the good news is is that we've been working with this population for so long, anyways that it, it feels that we have some answers. It feels that we feels that we do. So I feel I feel grateful that we've been working with people who've been. Um, who've been so sick for so long and helping them along, I think that we can help well, with this new set. Yeah, basically, symptoms. what we've learned from chronic illness it applies to just wellness, which exactly. is the, which is the, the I think that the the the, the um, most interesting thing is all, all these years we felt we were just treating you know chronically ill people and discover that healthy people respond to the same things, especially when they're stressed. So thank yes. you all so much for your attention. And I, again, we apologize that uh, this has been such a debacle as far as the uh, technical end. And uh, we'll, we'll fix that chat. And whoever sent that, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.